Good day. Today we're going to be installing and explaining Arch Linux. This episode one, we're going to get ourselves bootable. The series in general will aim to explain not only what we're doing, but why we're doing it, what the commands mean, and why you might want to run them in order to configure your system in such and such a way. This episode will mainly be following the install wiki. I'll be explaining commands as we go with the intention of being accessible to power users from other platforms hopefully interesting to other Linux users. So the first thing that we want to do after we've booted into UEFI mode off the latest ISO is check whether or not we're connected to the internet. Here, ping is the name of a program that's on our system and gnu.org is just a web address. Since we're getting any responses at all, we know that we're connected to the net. Now we didn't tell ping to stop, so it's just gonna go on forever. Uh, the way that we cancel a running command is with control C. Awesome, we're connected to the net. Now our goal here is to set up our system on the hard drive of this computer. We're going to use the command lsblk for list block devices. Here block devices basically means storage devices. We can see three of them. Loop zero is a loopback device. This is a special virtual device. It doesn't actually correspond to anything physical. So we can see two physical devices, SR zero and VDA. Uh, SR zero is actually our bootable USB, the one that we're running off at the moment. Uh, we can tell that because if we look at its size, it's 790 megabytes. Uh, this is actually the size of the Arch ISO. And we can also tell because it has a mount point. Now this means that uh, the contents of this ISO are actually accessible on the file system. We can go look at them. Uh, but VDA, our hard drive, doesn't have a mount point. Uh, this is both because there's nothing on it at all and because we haven't told it to mount anywhere. It's not necessary for the system to boot in the same way that the uh, bootable USB obviously is. Great. We want to format this disk the same as we would if we were doing a graphical install, but we're going to use a command line utility to do that called fdisk for format disk. Now, because I'm a level 70 Unix wizard who's read the manual, I know that even when the hard drives aren't mounted, they are represented on the file system in the slash dev folder for devices. We're looking for the VDA device. So slash dev slash VDA is the argument that we will give to fdisk and it'll open up in its own little text-based user interface. We want to build partitions on this, basically putting fence posts into the uh, hard drive to say this is where one particular block with some data in it is going to begin and this is where it's going to end. In order to do that, we need a partition table. This is going to tell you know, the uh, operating system or anything else that might be looking at this drive that there are several partitions in it. Uh, FDisk has defaulted to giving us a uh, MBR master boot record partition table. Particularly for our drive, there's nothing wrong with using something like this, but something to keep in mind is that master boot record only works with hard drives of two terabyte capacity or less. If you've got a larger one, you're going to need to use a more modern partitioning table like GPT, uh, which is what we're going to do, even though we don't strictly need to here, just so that it's going to be easier for you to follow along if you do have a larger hard drive. So to make a GPT partition table uh, in the FDisk interface, we can just type G and hit enter. Great. So now we need to actually make our partitions. The wiki recommends that we make three. The root partition is at the top of Unix-like file systems. It's literally the uppermost folder, mounted at the root of the file system tree. Every file that we can see is inside of that directory. The boot partition, which will be mounted at slash boot, contains all of the programs that the motherboard refers to when we turn the computer on and actually initialize our environment for us. The third partition that the wiki suggests is a swap partition. Swap's a bit different. It's a section of hard drive that's used as RAM overflow. And the traditional way to implement it is by sectioning off a dedicated partition. Swap isn't strictly necessary, but it can speed things up if you're compiling something or rendering video or using Google Chrome. Uh, we are going to make some swap space, but we will make a swap file later on. 
A swap partition can be a little bit unwieldy. You can't resize it or get rid of it as easily. So we're gonna skip this one. We will, however, make a third partition, a home partition. So your home folder, as Mac OS users will probably know, uh, is the folder in which all of your user files go. If you download some uh, photos or videos or something like that, it's gonna go in that folder. Uh, all of your settings are also saved to configuration files in this folder. And making a home partition, a dedicated partition for it, basically means that if we decide to reinstall our system or decide to install a completely different Linux system or even a BSD system or something like that, we can just remount the home partition and have all of our files and all of our settings still available to us as a user without having to reinitialize from a backup. So to make a new partition in FDisk, we just type N for new partition and it's gonna tell us what partition number do we want. For this one, we're just gonna put one. The first sector, literally the physical portion of your drive that this partition's gonna start at, uh, it's gonna start here at the earliest available one. You can see that's uh, sector 2048. The first uh, 2048 bytes of this drive have been taken up with our partition table that we made earlier. So this is a fine place to start. Now, when we set the last sector, we want to do so a certain number of bytes after the start of this partition so that we can specify the size of the partition. This one's going to be our boot partition and we wanna make it 300 megabytes. We can do that by putting in plus 300 capital M here, which will specify that we want our last sector to be 300 megabytes after our first. Awesome. Now we wanna make our root partition. Since all of our user files are going to be in our home folder and our home partition, this doesn't need to be particularly big either. Uh, however, we are gonna have a lot of system files in here. Uh, a lot of system binaries are going to be in here depending on how you install your software. So it does need to be a decent size. We're going to make it 15 gig. And we can do that by putting in plus 15 capital G here for our last sector. Great. Now, our final partition, our home partition, uh, is going to just take up the rest of this drive. So we can just hit enter, 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 and this is gonna be done. To actually write these changes to disk, currently these are just proposed changes, we can type W into our FDisk uh, interface, and we're done. Now that we've finished marking off the start and end of our file systems, let's run lsblk to check our handiwork. We can see here the three partitions that we've made are of the correct size, good, good. Before we can start putting files inside them, we need to fill them with file systems. For the root and home partitions, we can use the standard Linux file system ext4, and we're going to use the utility mkfs to make the file system. The syntax for this particular program, we put the name of the file system type we want to build after we name the program with dot ext4, and then we specify where we want to build them. Remember that hard drives or any other devices are represented in the slash dev folder, and we want to build our ext4 file system in vda2, which is our root partition. Awesome. Now we want to build the same file system in vda3. To pull up the command we just ran, we can push up on our arrow keys and replace this two with a three. Build the same thing on our home partition. Now our boot partition, the one that uh, the motherboard refers to when we're actually turning the computer on, needs to be the FAT32 file system, the same one that you would find on a USB. In order to build that, we're going to need to give MKFS a couple of other options. So MKFS, dot fat for fat32 and then we're going to give it dash f 32 and again specify where we want it which is slash dev slash vda1 awesome now our file systems are built now they're done let's mount them to our working file system so that we can see them the arch bootable media actually has a dedicated folder for this so let's give it a go mount and then the partition we want to mount, we're going to start with our root partition, which is VDA2, so slash dev slash VDA2, and mount it to the slash MNT folder. Awesome.
awesome. Now, we want to mount our other two partitions into folders that exist inside of our root partition. So we better make those folders so that we've got somewhere to mount them. We can make a directory with the mkdir command, and then we just need to specify where we're making it. To make the boot directory, we do slash mnt slash boot. And to make the home directory, we do slash mnt slash home. Now we want to mount our other two systems to these directories. We use the same mount command, mount. Let's mount our root, our boot partition rather to boot. And let's mount our home partition to home. Now this shell isn't just used for running commands. It can also be used to move around the file system. Well, maybe we do just use it for running commands. We are going to run a commands to move around the file system. Let's change our directory with cd to slash mnt so that we can check out our new uh, work in progress root directory. To list everything that's inside it, we can type ls. We can see there's not a lot in here now. Lost plus found is actually just an artifact of ext4. It's part of the file system. So the only two things we really have are the boot and home folders. Now comes the fun bit. We're going to install our base system in just one command. Now it's going to be a pretty long running command, so I'll type it out first and then explain to you. pack strap dash k slash mnt base linux linux dash firmware. Pacman is the standard package manager used by Arch to install and update software. Packstrap is the tool used to strap basic system packages, including Pacman, onto a new root directory. Base, Linux, and Linux firmware should contain what we need to get going, and the dash K option will give us a new keyring we can use to verify software from the Arch repositories. Arguments given with a dash in front of them are called options. Dash K isn't a package per se, it's just there to tell Packstrap that the target system doesn't have a keyring yet. Cool. Now that our base system is installed, if we list what's in our current root directory, we can see there's a lot more going on. Now currently, our boot and root partitions are mounted on the correct folders, but this isn't going to be the case once we reboot we need to put where these partitions are supposed to be mounted into a file. The file is going to be slash etc slash fstab, and to generate one, we can use gen fstab. Now, if we run gen fstab on the root directory for our bootable USB, it's going to spit back out to us a whole bunch of text, which tells us where everything is currently mounted uh, and some options to have it mounted correctly. We can see here that the device SR0, which is our bootable USB, is mounted, as is that virtual device Loop0. We don't want those two to be mounted or for Linux to attempt to mount them when we reboot. Uh, so we're going to change the command up a little bit. We're going to run genfstab-u slash mnt. The dash u is going to only print out those partitions that are mounted on or under the folder we give it. So if we run this command now, we see it's only going to spit out our three partitions. Very good. Now we want this written to the etc fs tab file. And we can do that by putting in double arrows, which is going to tell the shell to write whatever this spits out to a particular file. We then give it the location of the file which is slash mnt for our new root directory, slash etc, slash fs tab. Now, to check whether or not this works, we're going to actually open up this file. It's just a text file. So we're going to use a text editor called nano. Give it the path to that, which is slash mnt, slash etc, slash fs tab. And we can see those file systems there. Uh, Note that everything that has a hash in front of it is commented out. That means that the operating system or any other programs 
won't actually read those. They're just there for us humans to kind of get an idea of what's going on so that we're not just confronted with a wall of code. Now, Nano's user interface is a little bit more complicated. The program has a lot more features than anything else we've used so far. And our control C won't actually exit us out of this program. As we can see from the little cheat sheet down the bottom, control C is actually a hotkey inside the program to go to a location. Um, so control C isn't gonna work. To exit out of this, we should use the exit hotkey, which is also on the little cheat sheet down there, control X. Now we're exited out of the program, but we've still got all of this stuff here. Uh, we can push control L, which is the hotkey to clear the screen. Our system is now built to the extent that we can start using it. chroot is the command to log into other Unix-like systems, and Arch has a handy preset for this specific use case called Arch chroot. All we have to do is tell it where our new root file system is mounted to, slash nmt, and we are now logged into our own work in progress Arch Linux installation. Now is when we do most of the stuff you'd expect to be asked about in graphical installers. Networking, setting time zones, username and passwords, system language, etc. First up, the system doesn't actually have any software for talking to the internet. It can still access it now because the bootable USB is sort of spoon feeding it. But to make sure we're not offline when we start up ourselves, we're going to use a package called Network Manager. To install a new package, we use Pacman. And the syntax for it is pacman s network manager. Here, the dash s stands for sync because we are syncing the software on our system with the software in the Arch Linux repositories. And you can see it's going to pull down for us not just network manager, but also all of its dependencies so that we can get full functionality out of this package. Now, Network Manager isn't actually configured to start at boot. We could manually start it every time we want to use the internet, but I'm not all about that, so let's configure it to start at boot. To do this, we need to tell the init system, which is the first program to be started once the kernel has initialized, that Network Manager must be enabled on boot. Arch Linux uses systemd as its init system, and the syntax to enable something to start up at boot is system ctl enable network manager. Now, annoyingly, the network manager devs have made the N and M in network manager capital, whereas the Arch Linux devs have made the package on their servers lowercase N and M. Uh, I mentioned this only because it gave me no end of headaches when I was a new user. When you're interacting with network manager on your system, remember to capitalize it and when you're trying to download it externally on an Arch system, it is lowercase. Now onto time zones. Our original packstrap command actually downloaded for us a set of files that keep track of the time in every time zone, daylight savings, stuff like that. These are saved in slash user share zone info. Now other apps will read etc local time to get our local time. So we could copy the appropriate file that we downloaded into that directory, but rather than moving system files around, we can create a symbolic link so that anything trying to read slash etc slash local time will instead read the correct time zone file. Let's say that I'm in Sydney. To make a symbolic link, we would type ln dash sf, the location that we want to link to, which is user, share zone info Australia Sydney and then the location that we want to be linked or that we want uh, the link to be located at rather which is slash etc slash local time the s option makes a link symbolic so that apps know they're not dealing with the original file and the F option force replaces an existing file if there happens to be one at etc slash local time. Next, language. Like before, our packstrap command downloaded layouts for every type of keyboard used in every country. 
Right now, it's using whatever locale was passed through by the bootable USB, but we want to tell it what to expect when it started on its own. To do that, we should edit a file at etc slash locale.gen, with, again with our text editor nano. We can see, unfortunately, nano is not installed on this system. Nano was a package that existed on our bootable USB, but we don't have it here yet. This is still a work in progress, minimal installation. We probably want to download that. It's a useful package. So we can do that just like with Network Manager with Pacman S Nano. And let's try this again. Now, everything in this file is actually commented out. It has a little hash in front of it, which means that it won't be read by the operating system. It's just here for human readability. But what the file does contain, commented out, are the names of every keyboard layout you could conceivably want to use, all 507 lines. Uh, we're looking for ENUS UTF-8, which is the most common American keyboard layout and also the one we use here in Australia. We can use Nano's where is shortcut in order to find where a particular bit of text is in the file. So we go control W, EN underscore US, and we can see this is the uh, keyboard layout that we want to use. Uncomment it, which just means deleting the little hash at the start, and we're done here. To save the file, we do control O, enter, and to exit, we control X. Control L to clear the screen. Now this sets the keyboard layout, but unfortunately we have a couple of other steps to set the language itself. Language is defined in a different file that we're going to open with nano. So nano etc locale.conf. C O N F. This is a new file that we're going to be creating with nano, and we're going to put in just simply capital letters lang equals and then that same thing that was in the other file, en underscore us.utf8, or utf-8, uh, and save it with control O and exit. Now, what this is gonna do is set the system language to American English. Now, there are actually other locales that we could use. There's an Australian English locale, there's a British English locale, which would actually give us correct spelling. But unfortunately, software developers are lazy and often American. And what they tend to do is just program the one language for their piece of software. So you might end up with error messages saying that your locale isn't supported if you put in a locale that will actually give you correct spelling. Uh, so as much as it hurts my soul, we're going to be using the American English language locale today. Once we've done both of these steps, to finish generating our locale, we use the command locale-gen, which is going to copy what we've written into these two files into several other places where other programs are going to expect to have locale information. And we're done here. Now, the last couple of steps we want to do here in configuration is create a user and set a name for the system. To add a new user, we use the user add command, and we're going to give it the mg options. The m option is going to create a new home folder for this user, since this is our first time using this home partition. There's currently nothing on it. Uh, this will just make a new folder for us. You shouldn't be doing this if it's your uh, you're using the same home partition on a new system. But you will be using the g option the G option adds the user to a group. And we're actually gonna put the group first before the name of the user. We're gonna put wheel. Uh, savvy users will probably be able to guess why. Other users are gonna to have to find out in a minute. But now we put the user name. This can be anything that we want. We're gonna call ours custard. Done. We might wanna set a password for that user. We do that with the passwd command then the username, which is custard in our case. Type in a new, very secure password. Awesome. Uh, we probably also want to set a password for the root user while we're here. 
The root account is kind of like the admin account. It can do whatever we want. It's the one that we're logged into at the moment while we're configuring the system. You don't want just anyone to be able to log into that. So let's set a password with pass wd. And we don't put a username for this one. It'll actually default to the root user. Make sure this password is extra secure. And we're done. Now at the moment, we can see we have root at arch ISO uh, to the left hand side of our prompt here. This is because we're the root user and we're logged in via the arch ISO. When we reboot the system, it will say something like custard at arch, but that's not very creative. Maybe we'll want it to be at something else. Let's give this system a name. We do that by editing the dash etc dash host name file which is a new file for us. And we can just add whatever we want here and that will be the name of the system. I'll make mine Ville Green. Save with Control O, exit with Control X. The last thing we need to do before we're bootable is install a bootloader. Remember how I said that in the boot partition, we were going to have the programs that the motherboard will refer to when we turn the system on? Well, one of the most important of these is the bootloader. We're going to use grub as our bootloader, so we should install it with pacman sync grub. And since we're using a UEFI system, we're also going to need a package called EFI boot MGR for EFI boot manager. There we go, must have misspelled it on the first run through. Now, Grub is a very general bootloader. You may have heard that Linux runs on just about everything. It runs on supercomputers, it runs on Internet of Things devices, it runs on phones, uh, it can run on a whole host of different devices. And Grub could be used to boot just about all of them, which means that when we're installing or we're configuring Grub, on this particular system, we need to give it a couple of options to tell it just what kind of an environment it's in. So to install grub, we use the grub install command, and we need to tell it a few different things. The first thing we're gonna tell it is target equals x86 underscore 64 dash EFI, which will tell it that we're installing it on an x86 64 bit system using EFI rather than legacy boot. This would be different if you were installing it on an old system or say on a new M1 Mac, which is not an x86-64 platform. The next thing we're going to tell it is EFI directory equals slash boot. This is telling it that our boot partition is mounted at slash boot and that's where it should put itself. And lastly, we need to tell it that it's boot loader ID is grub. We don't technically need to call it grub. You could call it whatever you want, uh, but this is just going to be what it announces itself as to the motherboard, what you'll see on your motherboard's boot options uh, when you're reordering it, if you're reordering it to boot into something else. Awesome. Finally, we want to make a grub configuration file. Uh, this is the file that you would use to, uh, say, put other options into your grub menu, maybe get rid of the grub menu entirely so that you just boot straight in, maybe give it a special theme so that it looks kind of cool. Uh, to do this, we use the grub mkconfig command. We give it the O option and tell it that it ought to be located at boot grub grub dot. CFG. Uh, I don't actually know what the dash O option does in grub make config. If somebody does know, please tell me in the comments. Awesome. Our system ought now be fully bootable. It's time to turn it off, unplug the USB and cross our fingers. Uh, to reboot the computer from the command line, we can first exit this ch root and then run the reboot command. Do remember to remove your installation media before it starts back up, or it's just going to boot straight back into the bootable USB. 
and we've got a login screen. Join us now and share the software. You'll be free hackers. Let's log in with the account we created earlier. Great, we've got our user prompt, custard at vilgreen, lsplk. We can see that our partitions are mounted correctly. Technically, we're done. We have now installed Arch Linux, but there are three loose ends before we finish up today. First of all, this user doesn't have permission to do system administration. Let's try and install something. Lynx is a text-based web browser. That's cool enough. Let's give it a go. We can see that we don't actually have the permission to run this command. This is technically the point. Running the root user for everything is a really, really, really bad idea but we do want to be able to use the power of the root user by just putting in a password. We want sudo. To quickly log into root, sometimes called the super user, we type su. Make sure we put in the password that we set for the root user earlier. Cool, let's download sudo. Now we want to add our user to the sudo configuration file so that they can use root powers by just putting in their password. Just editing the sudo as file is not good for security. There's a dedicated command for it, but it assumes you're using a different text editor called vi. We can open it in nano like this. Editor in capitals equals nano vi sudo. Uh, editor there, all in capitals, set an environment variable uh, for what our editor is away from the default and vysudo just opens up this particular file in whatever your default editor is. We're looking for a line right near the bottom of this file that's going to say something like uncomment to allow members of group wheel to execute any command. Uh, this is why we added our user to the wheel group earlier. Uh, if we uncomment this guy here, then our user will be able to execute whatever command we want by just putting in their password. So control O to save, control X, type exit to exit the super user prompts that we have open and get back to the user we originally logged in with. And let's try sudo hackman sync links. We can see we have to put in our sudo password and we can install the browser like so. As a very brief demo, Lynx is a pretty cool project. You can run it just from your terminal, do Lynx, and then the URL that you want. Let's try google.com. And we can see we're actually browsing the web, you know, kind of. The down arrow enough, we can actually try a search, test, Google search, and we can obviously only display text here, but we could, in principle, visit websites and see what they've got to say. Very cool. To exit out of it, control C, and we're done with user permissions. Our second loose end is repositories. Now, I remember when I was a novice Linux user, one of the first questions that I had was, where is all this software coming from? You know, coming from Windows, you just go to some website and you hit download, you can get your software from wherever. Linux is supposed to be more open, more freeing, but all the software seems to be coming from where exactly? Some centralized server? Well, actually, we can see where all of our software is coming from. It's stored in a file called the mirror list. So to open it up with nano, we would go nano-etc-pacman.d slash mirror list. Oop, must have spelled that wrong. List. That's better. Uh, we can see here that we have several servers. These all host exactly the same files. They're mirrors uh, that are associated with the official, pack, uh, official Arch Linux project and store all of the software that they have approved. You could, in principle, replace all of these with your own server. And in fact, if you were changing from Arch Linux to some other distribution, that uses Pac-Man as its package manager, the most important step 
is just changing the servers that are in this file to the servers that then host this other distribution's software. Uh, so it is just as open, uh, but yes, things are centralized, they are centralized here. Now you can see that these mirrors are all over the world. We've got some Czech ones I can see, we've got some German ones, uh, probably some American ones, I'm guessing those are the ones that are just .org or .com. Uh, this should give you pretty decent speeds wherever you are in the world, but we just inherited this list from the uh, bootable USB that we had earlier. They're not actually going to contain the fastest servers that exist in the Arch Linux, pro Arch Linux project for wherever we happen to be. Now see at the top here, it says Arch Linux mirror list generated by Reflector. Reflector is a program that will sort through all of the officially registered mirrors uh, and only use the fastest ones. So if we download and run Reflector, we should be able to download and run all of our other programs much faster. So let's do that. sudo pacman sync reflector. This is a Python script, so we need to download the Python runtime in order to make it work. Uh, that's fine. We probably want Python on this system anyway. There's not a lot of useful things that that language is used for. And then we run Reflector. Uh, we need root privileges in order to do this because it's going to be changing that file, which is a system file. It's outside of our home directory. So we run it with sudo reflector. Cool, we now have the fastest mirrors available. As an aside, we don't have to worry about tampering in any of them. That key ring that we uh, downloaded from the ISO earlier uh, will allow us to verify that all of the packages we download have been signed by an official developer. The last loose end, we wanna make that swap file. To make a swap file, we first make a file of the appropriate size and then designate it swap. We're going to use sudo dd. Uh, which is a utility for directly copying the data from an input file to an output file. The input file, we're going to use if equals dash dev dash zero. This is a virtual file or a virtual device that just contains an infinite number of zeros. So we're going to be copying empty data effectively to an output file, of. This is going to be slash swap which is where our swap file is going to live. We're going to copy these zeros in block sizes of one megabyte. So go block size equals one M. And we're going to copy 4,000 of these blocks of zeros. So count, which is the number of times we're going to do this copy, equals 4K for 4,000. And we're going to put in status equals progress which will give us a little status of how the copy is going. And now we wait for four gigabytes worth of zeros to be copied to this newly created file. Now, another change between Windows and Linux is that files themselves come with permissions. These permissions dictate who owns the file and what people of different groups or different users can do to this file. There are three types of permissions. You can read, you can write, and you can execute. And the command to modify these permissions is called chmod. We're going to, which needs to be run as sudo. We're going to change the permissions on this swap file to 0600 on slash swap file. Oh, whoops, we just called it swap. CHMOD changes the permissions of a file, and the numbers correspond to user ID, user permissions, group permissions, if the owner is a member of a group like Wheel, and other user permissions. Permission to read, write, and execute are all expressed in a single digit. Execute is 1, write is 2, read is 4. So if you want more than one permission, you add them. For example, the owner root has permission to read and write, but not execute. But nobody else, no matter what their group is or what their user is, can read or write to this file. 
These are good permissions for the swap file to have because it's RAM overflow. You don't want to have some unprivileged user, some malicious attacker to be able to read the contents of your RAM. That would be a very bad idea. Next, we want to format the inside of the file to make it look like swap, to look like that RAM overflow. And we use that, to do that, we use the command mkswap, which again has to be run with root privileges, sudo mkswap-u clear swap file, or swap in our case. Awesome. The dash u option will generate a UUID, a unique identifier that's given to physical device labels, and it will apply this to a swap file, getting rid of the UUID that it inherits from the drive label that it's on from the root partition. To actually initialize it as swap, fit, swap space, we go sudo swap on dash swap. And now that swap file is actually being used as RAM overflow. If we were using too much memory, it would be written to that file. Uh, but remember, we need to add this to etc fs tab, that file where we put all of the other partitions that were mounted earlier. We need to put this onto it. Otherwise, we're going to need to initialize it every time we start our system. So we go sudo nano dash etc dash fs tab. So go down to the bottom of the file, and since the swap file is already visible in the file system, we don't need that UUID, we don't need to tell it uh, a unique identifier for physical hardware, but we do need to tell the file system table where it can find the swap file. It can be found at slash swap. The next entry in a FS tab is the mount point. We don't want this to be mounted. We don't want the contents of it to be readable to anyone. So we write none here. The next thing is the type of partition that it is, the type of file system that it is. It is swap. So we write swap. Next, we write the uh, options. We can just write defaults here. And then we put these numbers, which refer to other options. We don't need to worry about them now. We can just put zero, zero. And we're done. Uh, since we're here, we may as well add a comment just so that we know what we're talking about. If we come back here, we know what this line refers to. So let's write a comment that says swap file. Cool. And we control O to write it out and control X to exit. We're all done. In future episodes, I will install and discuss a graphical environment, web browser, packaging formats, and more. But for now, we will celebrate in the tradition of Arch users by downloading and running NeoFetch.